All right, thank you for staying with us. The stakes are higher for the 2023 general election as women are no longer relegated to the singing, dancing and Ashwebi roles. They are now leading strategy and campaigns and serving as spokespersons. Although this is a welcome development, women still have a big, a long way rather to go as the violence and inequality against women still persists in the society. This has called for global action to increase awareness, promote advocacy, and create opportunities for discussion on challenges and solutions. Joining us in the studio is Executive Director, Hazy Health Initiative, Rhoda Robinson. It's good to have you on the program. Good to see you. Good to see you, <laughs> good good to see you again. Good morning. Good morning. Hey. Hey. When it comes to issues about uh, women, mm. the government through the constitution, their documents, you know, you know, backing the criminalization of violence against women. We also have the VAP yeah, Act, VAP Act but um, not much has been done because mm. a recent report that I got says uh, over 3,000 cases of sexual and gender-based violence since 2020 to 2021, but just 11 convicted cases. Mm -hmm. What really is the issue? What are the bottlenecks? Okay, thank you so much. Like, as you've said, um, we finally have legal instruments yeah. that support the protection of women and girls from violence. Um, the VAP Act of 2015, we have various domestic, state domestic violence laws, um, we have the gender um, laws, we have gender policies, all towards protecting uh, women and girls from violence. However, it doesn't just stop at these laws we need to implement these laws. And when you're looking at implementation, when you're looking at the effective um, persecution of perpetrators, you need to take into account that uh, apart from the laws, we have other aspects of prevention, response, for survivors and systems that need to be put in place. Mm. You said that we have, over, we have thousands of reported cases, but less than 20 um, convicted cases. And, um, one of the major issues that we've seen with this is one, the cost of actually getting conviction. The time it takes mm. for a case to go through the entire legal process from when it's, um, the case is lodged at the police station to when it gets into court and the numerous um, callbacks and readings and testimonies that has, to be go that has to go into place. So we need to find a system that takes into account the limited resources that different states and our judiciary, judiciary system has and how we can improve upon this so that justice can be affordable for survivors. Imagine if you're living in a rural community and um, you unfortunately are a victim of sexual violence, of rape. And from the point at which you go to the police station to lodge a complaint, um, you start paying bills from the filing for them to collect uh, uh, evidence, for them to pick up the uh, accused bills start at that point. Now, if you're most and most of the time, victims are um, from poor, impoverished communities, a majority of them, you cannot afford those kinds of bills. You can't afford to um, the entire circus around trying to get the police to pick up the perpetrator and go to court and all that thing. I've been through that myself and I can tell you it's, it's tasking as a supporter, not to talk of if you are actually the survivor of that incident, mm. majority of the time looking at that stress, looking at the pressure from community, which exists till now, mm. because a lot of communities still want to keep that under wraps, especially when you have in cases of incest. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they want to still keep that under wraps. So working across that, working across the legal aspect, the financial burden of it, it takes a heavy toll. And we need to start having deliberate investments into ensuring that these legal instruments that we have signed into law, that we have provided, actually work for survivors of sexual violence, of um, violence against women, of traditional harmful practices. It works to prevent the violence from happening. It works to support them if the violence does happen. And it works to, um, uh, to help them get through that process at the end of the day. Mm. What should... Um Professional women bodies, like you know, we, in the, in the law profession, we have association of women lawyers. Yeah, in the don't. media, we have them. In account accountancy, we have them. In NGOs and all of that, 
what should they all do when it comes to collaborating together, mm -hmm. you know, to ensure that uh, some of these costs that you talked about mm -hmm. can be offset or, or sometimes even taking up cases pro bono and so on. What should they be doing? What should we be seeing differently? Because uh, we see that it is becoming a little challenging when we have a patriarchal system mm -hmm. for the men to be the champion. Of course, there are so many men who are in support yes. of, oh, fine, we need to get rid of this and create a, you know, a level playing field for everyone, equality and all of that. But certainly, we still have the patriarchal system. But it, within that space, what should these women bodies be doing? Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. I'll, I'll give an example of um, the Stop Cut Project. As you know, AC has been working for the past couple of years on ending female genital mutilation. And one of the key things that we have done is to ensure that those bodies that exist are part of that greater alliance towards ending female genital mutilations. We have the FIDA, we have the NAWAJ, we have all this uh, association, these groups of women body that are in existence and building their capacity to be able to understand what is happening because you might find that yes violence against women and girls now is public knowledge it's no longer a cultural thing it's now seen as a criminal act mm. but a lot of people still do not understand exactly what that means exactly what goes into um, prevention, advocacy, educating people to change their behavior into understanding that you cannot continue abusing women, abusing girls in the name of it's, it's part of culture, what we've been doing so far. So associations like this need to increase advocacy. Um, when you look at the media now, um, going into investigative journalism, covering more stories that talk about it, because it is harder to keep something under wraps when more people know about it, when more people are interested in that case. We've seen it happen so many times. We've seen it happen with the Me Too movement. We've seen it happen in Nigeria with different cases of um, gender-based violence, of sexual assault, that when the larger population gets involved in the case, it is harder for that case to die down or to be buried under heaps of um, red tape and bureaucracy and things like that. So we need the media to start pushing for stories like that, covering stories like that. And when you look at the legal aspects, um, pro bono is a very big thing that can help. A lot of people cannot afford legal help. Even within the middle class, it is still a struggle to afford legal help. So pro bono services offered for cases of um, violence against women across the entire spectrum would help in cases like this. And when you have um, uh, organizations, CSO, non-profit organization, contributing and supporting to the rehabilitation of survivors, this also helps because in that, it doesn't just, even if or when the perpetrator um, gets convicted, a lifetime has been changed. How does she move from that point mm. to start revaluing herself, re being uh, moving away from the stigma and discrimination that comes with being known as a survivor of either sexual violence or domestic violence or things like that? How does she move her family in the case of um, mothers who have been through domestic violence or, or abusive partnerships? How do they move from that point to be able to sustain themselves and take care of their families where they are now? the major breadwinner. So we need um, organizations to come in in aspects of th those kind of uh, aspects. And when you're looking in the state aspect, they ha there are ministries dedicated to things like this. You have the NAPTIP agency that works on this. NAPTIP has the sexual assault um, register, offenders register, that a lot of people need to start looking into because you can stop a reoccurrence if you, you, those people that have been put in, you know them and we can ensure that those people are also monitored so that they don't go to another state, another community and do the same thing. A lot of um, offenders are repeat offenders. Mm. So yeah. if we can stop that from happening again, we can be saving a life. So this is something that this information, the knowledge is something that we need to put out there as key stakeholders who have the knowledge, we have the platforms as well to be able to do this kind of thing. All right, we need to quickly go on a commercial break. When we return, we'll continue the conversation. Okay. All right, thank you for staying with us. We've been speaking with uh, Rhoda Robinson, who has been talking to us about the matter of uh, sexual uh, violence against uh, women. She is the executive director of Hazy Health Initiative. And... Uh, before we came back on the break, we were talking about the cost, mm. you know, of investigation, the whole process, how it's become cumbersome. And if you could just give us an insight into 
what it takes uh, in terms of monies now, how okay. much it costs. Okay, so let me give an instance. Yeah. Um, say in the event that you have um, a rape case that has been reported mm -hmm. to you, the first thing you need to do is ensure that evidence is collected mm -hmm. that's going to a hospital so that they take forensic evidence. Majority of the time, there is no um, rape kit available for that to be done. So you have to pay for something like that. And then this kind of processes of taking um, semen sample when it's available can run into hundreds of thousands. And that's one. That's actually having to take um, that person for medical care. You have to pay the bills of that medical care. A lot of times, these people cannot pay their bills. You have to pay that bill. And then when you now go to report the case um, at the police station, because it can come either way. So either you go to the police station first, depending on the severity of that attack. Mm -hmm. Go to the police station or the hospital. When you get to the police station, you have to file that case. That costs money. You have to, um, they have to go with you. If you're going to the hospital again, they have to go with you to the hospital. That costs money. Um, you, the cost of paying for the filing and, and, and the everything. the burden has to be on the victim. The burden is on the victim. Mm -hmm. The burden is on the victim. When you come back, if you have to pick up the perpetrator, or if How you have to are find it, it can go from, uh, depending on the police station, depending on the case, it can go from 5,000 upwards. If they have to go and pick up the perpetrator, you are filling that car. Whatever vehicle that they are going to use, you are going to provide it so that they can go. Paradventure, the person escapes. If you are going to track that person, you are going to pay for that. There was a case we handled, and we had to pay for them to track the phone number to find where that person was. Now, the person had moved to another state. Getting them to um, pick up the person from the another state was another bill entirely, over 100,000 around, because the states were far apart. They said they could not get, um, they could not have them um, pick up the person there and transfer the person. They don't have the facility or the funding to do that as well. So when, so when you look at all that, and then you're not, going, you're not coming to getting that case charged to court, the legal bills that are involved in filing the case in court as well. The legal bills in if the perpetrator or the accused doesn't turn up and it gets moved again. But every time that moves, you have to transport the witnesses, the survivors to court and the police, everybody that is going to present uh, evidence in the case. Those bills fall on whoever it is that has taken up that case. A lot of times, survivors cannot do it. And when you think of that stress, that financial burden in the first place, mm. they just let it go. Now, our uh, laws provide that there is financial compensation. But a lot of times, we don't even get to that point. And then who pays the bills at the end of the day? After going through all that stress, the last thing on your mind is looking for, trying to push for financial return. You just want everything to be done mm. with. And a lot of people just drop the case and they would rather the perpetrator or the accused settles out of court so that they know that all that stress is gone. They don't have to spend money at all. I have a colleague that this, her entire organization is dedicated to funding that kind. And it is very, very hard. We cannot have a system that has been put in place without funding. You can't say that we have policies that prevents, protects uh, women and girls from violence. Mm -hmm. And then the money needed to make sure that those uh, facilities work does not exist. There's no budget for this thing. You're leaving it to the Office of the Public Defender who has so many cases that they are dealing with already. And you're putting the um, sexual violence and violence against women on that mm -hmm. as well. So they are stretched thin. And if there is no funding that is going into that, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to actually get convictions, because mm. there is no funding, there is no budget to secure convictions in the first place. So we might have cases that you, we've seen it numerous times, cases of 2017 that they are just getting your verdicts four years later. There are bills across that four years that somebody is picking up. A lot of times someone just stops because they cannot afford it anymore. So we need to start looking at how do we ensure that um, there is a systemic change that ensures that People who go for justice receive justice. People who go for care receive care. So get, they can get closure. Exactly, because you need day. this at the end of the day. Mm. You need to be able to talk to a counsellor. You need to be able to talk to um, someone who would listen to you. And How many trained counsellors uh, do we have that can offer their services free of charge to survivors of violence? There are not many. And there are so many people who are carrying this scar with them 
all through adulthood. It changes their perception. It changes their ability to be productive, not just for themselves, but for society as well. How many sexual, refer sexual and assault referral centers do we have in the States? We have um, teaching hospitals, one, in, one or two in each state. How much can they do to populations that are in the millions? And every day, the number of um, cases of violence against women and girls keeps increasing, especially now that we are seeing a very high rise in defilement. Yes. So we are looking at children that are going through this, this terrible, terrible practice, this terrible crime, and who is going to take care of them, both physically, mentally, and emotionally? Who is going to take care of the finances that is surrounds them getting the help that they need? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I keep asking this question around uh, the roles that religion and, and culture play in all of these, because mm. we are very religious people, yes. and we are very cultural people as well, because when we engage and interact on a daily basis, these are some of the things that are very quick to rear themselves when it comes to, oh, we talk about God easily, we talk about culture easily, you know, and, and so on. In a situation like this, mm -hmm. where when something happens and then people go to for counseling, mm -hmm. you know, either in a church or uh, people talk about the issue of, uh, you know, culturally, where this is supposed to be like this, mm -hmm. you know, and so on. But how does, the, how does it help or compound the situation we're talking about right now? Okay, a, a colleague of mine said recently, just before I came on, that um, violence against women is no longer cultural. It's criminal, mm -hmm. and we need to start looking at it from mm -hmm. that perspective first and foremost. Before you start um, saying that, oh, it's a family thing, yeah. or we do, we shouldn't get involved. This this um, exclude exclusion of whatever stay, mm -hmm. happens in the family stays in the family, and the only person that is allowed to interfere is either your religious leader or your cultural leader or your family head. We need to break that thought in the first place and understand that. When you perpetrate violence against a woman and girls, first and foremost, you have committed a crime. Mm -hmm. Whether or not um, the, the religious body that you belong to mends the relationship between you and that partner or the survivor and that partner is irrelevant to the fact that that crime has mm -hmm. been committed, mm -hmm. first and foremost. And we need to start emphasizing that. We need our religious bodies, those cultural and religious um, gatekeepers, to start emphasizing that. Even if you come to us, there are still penalties that you need to pay. Mm. We can sort out the, the internal problems that you may have, but you still need to pay those penalties. And we need to start, we need them, because a lot of people listen to their leaders, their mm. religious leaders, first before external parties. Mm. Because we've had cases mm. where a woman would come in, report domestic violence that has been going on for a long time. And then two, three months down the line, she goes AWOL. And you ask her why, she says that they've sorted it out. Give it a bit more time, she comes back again for the same case. Mm -hmm. So what are those people actually telling the partners? What are they saying to the woman? What are they saying to the man? Mm -hmm. What help are they giving in that space that mm -hmm. this is wrong? You are not allowed to do this. So they need to start and taking an active role in debunking that thought that it is allowable in the space of a family or in the space of your religious body, whether it's a church or a mosque, that that is allowed. It is no longer uh -huh. allowable for you to be violent against women and girls. And that is a role that they need to start playing. Right. Now we are in an election period. Everyone yeah. is campaigning and all of that. And we need to set an agenda for, for whoever takes up position, be it at the state level, mm -hmm. local government level, presidential and all of it. For you now, what would you want those who will be taking up the government positions as the elections happen, what would you want them to change? Because obviously the road to justice is quite a tortuous one for anyone who finds himself being a victim of sexual and uh, based violence. Yeah, I think one of the first things that I would say needs to be firmly in place is the fact that there's policies that are on ground they are not perfect. They are workable right now. They are not perfect. But we need to ensure that they work. We need to ensure that the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act works for people. We need to ensure that the agencies and the uh, ministries and the departments that are in place to implement this 
these policies or to act on these policies, that's um, the police, the judiciary system, um, the shelters, we need to ensure that they have the right capacity to, to um, implement these laws, that the police is trained to respond properly and to respond swiftly. This involves both political will and a budget. A lot of people do not want to talk about this. We need funding for this aspect of life. We need funding to prevent violence against persons, uh, violence against, uh, against women and girls. You cannot keep saying that you stand for women or you, uh, you believe um, in gender equality when you are not talking about how you are going to fund processes to ensure that gender equality is um, implemented or gender equality is achieved. You cannot say that you stand for women and girls if you are not ensuring that they are adequately protected from all forms of violence. When, mm. when you're talking about um, tra uh, harmful traditional practices, such as child marriages or female genital mutilation, whether you're talking about sexual violence within the family or domestic violence, you can't say that you stand for them when you are not funding those mm. aspects that we ensure that they are protected. And we need to ensure that there is more funding going into awareness creation. A lot of people still do not know. You'll be surprised how many people do not understand the negative effects of female genital mutilation. Educated adults mm -hmm. do not understand the process that, that is there. So we need to ensure that political leaders provide that political will and backing and funding to push the message out there, push the support systems out yeah. there, and ensure that everybody can access those services at when they need it. Okay. Absolutely. We have to leave the conversation here now. Executive Director, Hissy Health Initiative, Rhoda Robinson, thank you for your time. Thank you so much for thank having me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right.